mines, the uh, uh, Mine Enforcement and Safety Administration of the United States government. Then we'll hear from the UMWA Safety Division, and then we'll hear from one uh, coal operator, uh, Eastern Associate Coal, uh, who's safety director uh, nationally for the firm is present, his headquarters Beckley, as well as uh, <coughs> superintendent of the mines. To begin uh, this program then, the two people you will hear from the Mining Enforcement and Safety Administration or MESA will be Mr. Tisdale, the district director, and Mr. <coughs> McManus, the coal mine inspection supervisor. Both of uh, the, the district director is headquartered in the district office in Morgantown, and Mr. McManus is the supervisor of the Paramount office. Mr. Tisdale, who will speak first, has his uh, uh, degree in mining engineering from the University of Illinois and has a MBA from the University of Pittsburgh, and he's been with the government agencies for 14 years. And it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Tisdale from Mesa and Morgan. Mason, excuse me, is real glad to be able to participate in your class and try to explain a little bit to you as who we are. Uh, many people outside of the coal industry know what Mesa is. I know some people uh, around Morgantown ask me what do, uh, what do you do. And uh, while I work at Mesa, they give me a blank stare. So we welcome this opportunity to try to. Uh, explain to you who we are. <coughs> I noticed an article in the paper the other night that said Mesa was the most controversial agency in government. That might be true. And uh, our budget runs about, uh, I think, $79.5 million dollars is the sole budget for this coming year before that a big budget. Uh, so what we're going to try to do, Mr. McManus is going to give you some background on mine safety, on what has happened, what what occurred in past years that led up to where we are now. And then after he does that, well then I'll uh, come back up here and, and try to explain to you a little bit about who Mesa is, where are they, and what did they try to do. So without any further uh, discussion, then I'll turn this part of the meeting over to the Parliament now. I don't really know exactly what this class needs or wants. I have a prepared statement I'm going to speak on what led up to this 1969 Coal Mine Health and Safety Act. Primarily it was disaster. Most of these disasters occurred within a approximately 75 mile radius of Brown, West Virginia. As some of you people in here know. I'm safe in the early years as director to the Lord. To eliminating mine explosions, mine fires, and fatalities, and enactment of the laws. In the early years, mine explosion disaster, the fire or more men were killed. Uh, these things went unnoticed because, I guess, of communication at that time. The operators didn't take any action other than uh, just pass it off, pay the bill. During those early years, the loss of life was appalling, as you'll see in some of these slides I'm going to present. Some of the early pioneers of safety you know, studied these events surrounding explosions and mine fires and disasters found it very difficult to convince mine management to do anything about their findings or the recommendations or induce them to do anything at all. So during the 
years 1818 to 1910, there were records show of 7,000 fatalities related to explosions alone. The early proponents of safety in those years were having difficulties in convincing anyone that they could do better. Now this is the same history that happened throughout the world in all coal producing countries. The same thing happened. The early coal miners in the United States migrated here from Europe. Brought with them all our bad habits. Pardon me, Mr. Jackson. <laughs> and, uh, this is a well established fact. I don't think there's any confusion on it. So these opponents uh, couldn't get anything done by discussing their problems with mine management or mine owners or operators. They finally turned to government to try to get their reforms and improvements to provide better and safer working conditions. And the record reflects or parallels gradually increase in mine safety legislation that is Congress. Now that first explosion in the United States registered or recorded in the United States in 1910, 1810. This was at the Heath Pits located in Richmond, Virginia. 40 men were killed in this one. The report on that was written by a newspaper reporter. He did an excellent job not knowing too much about mining and relating this in the space. <coughs> Following enactment of the Organic Act of 1910, the Bureau of Mines was established on July 1, 1910. And the duties of uh, another branch of the survey was transferred to Bureau of Mines. Bureau of Mines at that time wasn't any more than a research agency. They just dealt with coal mine explosions, mine fires, no enforcement authority at all. And <clears throat> during the years 1881 and 1885, I think, uh, Mm -hmm. 1881 to 1885 didn't have too many coal mines that worked near the outcrop. There were 84 men killed per year. During the years 1886 and 1890, 66 men per year were killed. 1891 to 1895, 149 men per year were killed. 1895 through 1900, 146 men per year. 1901 through 1905, 305 men per year were killed. Through the year 1906 and 1910, there are 478 men per year. Uh, this shows a continual rise in fatalities per explosion year. More explosions, more mining, higher production, more exposure. This brings you up, say, to December 6, 1907, 1030 a.m., Monongo, number 689, located about six miles from here. Had a runaway trip, which caused both mines to explode, killing 362 men. This is the greatest disaster in the United States record. Uh, they did have one a few years back in China that uh, killed 1,100 and some men. And the reports, the people that are in the know or get information, have information that a larger disaster than this occurred in Russia not too long ago. But it hasn't been made public. The Bureau of Mines was established by Congress in July 1, 1910. <clears throat> the 
and they worked with uh, preventing explosions, and they also experimented with explosibility of mixtures, methane and coal dust. <coughs> these explosive ranges, these uh, two things, they generate about the same velocity and the same heat. But the coal dust expands over a wide area and it's involved. During all this time, fuel mines had no enforcement power whatsoever, and the fatalities continued on the rise. And the experimental mine was established in Bruce, Pennsylvania, to work on training a mine rescue team because of the increase of <coughs> disaster. They trained rescue teams. At Brewston, they also had field stations located throughout the United States doing the same thing. According to the records, mine management, other than the token effort, did not try to eliminate any of these disasters. The first Bituminous Code Mine Law was enacted in Illinois in 1872. The last state, which is the state now, enacted the law in 1917, which was the last. Early state laws and federal regulations generally were changed or modified after each explosion or disaster. It's like even the politicians took very little notice during those years. There were six disasters in 1940, which prompted Congress to enact Public Law 49. This gave the inspector the right of entry into any coal mine in the United States. He still didn't have any authority to enforce any rules or regulations. authorized to make inspections, investigations, and write reports of the any hazards he noted in the coal mine, he had no power to enforce them, or the only weapon he had was to try to talk to people and take an act. They weren't too receptive in the other those years. Uh, throw that fatal disaster records of the years 1930 to 1941. I happened to be involved in this 1940 and 41. That's when I started working on it. You can see with those figures, fatalities, disasters, also all fatalities were outrageous. It's, uh, I'd say it's immoral to Allow the industry to continue in business and allow this to go on in the industry and not try to take any action to prevent it. <coughs> Even though I was a party to it in 40, 41, I guess, I was lucky I wasn't in any disaster to associate with any fatality. On July 24, 1946, after consulting with the representative of labor, Industry, <coughs> Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Code, the Bituminous Coal and Lead Night Mines was issued by the Director of the Bureau of Mines. This is also incorporated into the Coal Rate Agreement by Tunis Coal Mine Operators and the UMW of America. A similar set of standards was adopted in the Amphistite region. This code was the basis for first federal inspection. Again, six major disasters occurred between January 18, 1951, and February 2, 1952. This uh, prompted Congress to take immediate action to enact the new law, which became effective in. 
this gave him force to retire. <coughs> At uh, 37 mandatory requirements, which the operator complied, he was required to comply with, and the inspector had authority to close his mind under these provisions, but they still only related to disaster type accidents, explosions, where four, five or more people were killed. The I think the two disasters had the most impact on Congress at this time was two explosions at Jackson Home State, Centralia, number five, Centralia, Illinois, where 111 men were killed. This was a dust explosion because I misused the explosion if my memory serves me right. Is that right? What you said. And another one occurred in 1951. The Orient, Orient number two mine, West Frankfort, Illinois. This is where Johnny O. Lewis made a statement. He's been famous and they've changed the reading of it a little bit, but during the hearing, following the Centralia disaster, Johnny O. Lewis made a statement to the press I think he meant it to the public and all coal mine operators, everyone associated with coal industry. He said, coal is saturated with the blood, too many men are drenched with the tears, too many widows in the world. Now this has been modified in later years by Arnold Miller. Arnold Miller's motto is, save your else, which I tend to agree with. None of these laws cover the ordinary day-to-day -day type accidents where you kill one man or two men, or you decapitate a man and trip him for life. <coughs> this came much later. This didn't even apply to small mines employing 14 men or less. Efforts by safety people at that time tended to try to have federal legislation <coughs> 14 in mind under this 1952 Coal Mines Act. And nothing was done about it until two explosions occurred in Tennessee. They have one, but there were two. 15 men killed in these two explosions. So, Congress reacted by amending the 1952 Act. These amendments were brought about in 1966 and brought these small operators under the jurisdiction of this law giving the inspector authority to enforce these 37 mandatory requirements. In the interim, they had, this thing had a code associated with it, which had 400 hazards relating to mine. It had no enforcement power there, but it was tied in with the con UMW contract that the operators would comply when these were cited or pointed out. <coughs> I've been associated with inspection work since 1962. I came out of the industry. And a lot of mines <coughs> would not comply with the code. They could not enforce the code. They wouldn't comply. <coughs> So everything went along pretty good for a while. Until under this amendment to this law, it gave another job to the Bureau of Mines. They were required to make a study for updating the 1952 Act. 
1968, the final report the study was presented to Congress. In fact, they had this in committee at the time. Congressman Kemp from Pennsylvania introduced this legislation, including 22 recommended additions to the 1952 Act. These amendments were in committee when the Farmington disaster took place. All of you are familiar with that, I'm sure. And after much uh, deliberation, public hearings, some of the people in this room may have testified before Congress. I know that uh, quite a number of people from around Fairmont did had their input into this 1969 Oman Health and Safety Act. Congress finally passed safety legislation on December the 30th, 1969, which is identified as the Federal Oman Health and Safety Act of 1969. About the first statement in this new law, the cause and purpose of this law declared to Congress first priority and concern of all persons in the coal industrial must be the health and safety that most precious resource, the mine. This had a hell of an impact on the industry. Some of these people in here know that work in the industry. I see four or five of them in here. <coughs> Also sure that uh, mo almost all the people in here know this is the most comprehensive piece of legislation ever thrust upon an end up. This cost millions and millions of dollars to implement this bill. Mesa or Bureau of Mines was a very small organization at that time, maybe 225 people. They gave a 30 day 60 day, 90 day moratorium on this thing for us. We had to gear up, get ready to get out into the field, try to eliminate some of these hazards that was delineated in this action. So this is what the new Code of Federal Regulations look like. It covers everything from health, environment, noise, just about anything that you can think of concerning health and safety and involved in coal mining contained to this book. Jack, you should have one on. This is a disaster for the last 10 years. 68 is when Farmington blew up. Seventy-two is when we had the Blacksville, plus a small explosion down southern West Virginia, uh, one four county fuel pit. You see the decline in the fatality. <coughs> the disaster. The past few years have been a lot of you have been doing a good job in the end up everyone. Not only the mine enforcement safety, UMW and all their members, all the operators and all their foremen. I think all people in the industry agree today that a high level of safety is absolutely necessary to prevent disasters occurring. It was in West Virginia in 1974, 36. This is way down from the previous year. The history of mining has been very disastrous through the attention of people from all over the United States. Anyone with associated around this area or 
living around this area at the time, Farmington, you know what went on. We had an influx of people from all over the United States, even some from out of the United States. They were looking for information. And uh, this is a quote from one of my old bosses. I'll conclude with this statement. Mining is an industry by its very nature, which demands a high degree of skill and knowledge for absolutely safe performance on behalf of all of its employees, both management and labor. This performance will not be achieved by governmental regulations or managerial rule alone, but also will require total cooperation of all persons associated with the industry. Now these uh, books here, I didn't stay strictly to this text, this thing here, you can have a copy of this. This one, Jack, finished any time you get ready to get it. If anyone has any thing they'd like to ask me, I'll try to give you an answer. <coughs> Is there any relationship between fatalities and total large work and all those type things? Yes, there is. Million man is more man hours work now than ever before. More production than ever before. Yet the fatalities are down, way down. This have a formula for working this up. The operator, uh, George Jackson, is well aware of what he has to do in reporting accidents and statistics. Part 80 of the law covers what they have to report. Can I respond to that a little bit? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you could get into uh, accident statistics and uh, spend quite a bit of time talking about them, which are predicated on nine R for uh, tons per accident ratio. And uh, the accident, lost time accidents, have been declining uh, over the past few years. But that's a science in itself. It's, um, I don't think we've got time to, to really discuss it here. The point of our program here was to show you that there's a buildup of legislation. There seems to be a buildup of public uh, tolerance to mine accidents. And it occurred in 1910. The government decided they'd do something. It occurred again in 1941 after a series of, of very disastrous explosions. Explosions are what gets the attention. We tried to show you that in those years there were also anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 men killed a year in the day-to-day -day type accidents. But the disasters captured the public's attention. Something was done. It was done in 1941. It was done again in 1952 after another series of uh, disasters, 47 disasters in Australia, 51 disaster in, uh, in Illinois, and then there were some in West Virginia, southern West Virginia at the time. Sort of built up to a crescendo, and then bang, we had new legislation. It happened again in 1966 uh, when the small mines were covered in the act. It happened again in 1968 whenever the uh, 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 Farmington disaster occurred. And all of us who are in the business realize it will happen again if there's another disaster. And what uh, one of the things I think we're running out of the time that was allotted to us, one of the things that we were going to try to explain to you is um, the uh, uh, various <coughs> concentration of material that's in this uh, uh, health and safety legislation. Some of the things that are different now than they used to be. The government has got a very large role to play now in day-to-day -day mining activities that they didn't used to have. And the material that Mac, uh, McManus has presented to you is uh, in one of these handout, handouts here. And I'd like for you to take it Consider this for your own use, and it is not, uh, uh, as I talked to uh, uh, Dr. Ross whenever we started to participate in this class, that you know, we'd like to be considered off the record. We'd like to not see any of this material reprinted in some uh, particular areas. For your use, there's nothing in it that you couldn't get by reading various uh, information pamphlets and pamphlets and whatnot, but it, it isn't something that I would like, you know, be published in the paper for us to be quoted. But uh, it, it will show this type of information. We've got a brochure on who Mesa is, 
uh, and then we've got an organization chart to show you the uh, location of Mesa, of Mesa within the Department of the Interior, where it exists. So feel free to pick up any of that stuff at, uh, at any time, yes. Uh, I may have missed it, but how many deaths would constitute a disaster? Well, that's that's just an arbitrary classification. Fire. Every every uh, uh, fatal accident or every accident that involves uh, fatality is investigated. There's a report written. Uh, it really is, is an arbitrary cutoff. If there's five or more people killed, it's called a major disaster. If there's less than five killed, it's called a minor disaster. And it's uh, uh, the reason. Uh, in fact, years ago. They started keeping this classification, and we still adhere to it, although it's not as important anymore. It's not important at all anymore now. We, we adhere to it because we uh, uh, we want to correlate with the old information. On, on this new revision reporting, minor disasters have been deemed all of them class one man, same as five, ten, hundred, or what have you. Yeah. But it, but if you want to if you want to count the number of disasters that happen now. With what happened years ago, you've got to use the same method of counting, which is a lot of uh, problems with statistical people run into when they start talking about lost time accidents or or break the line accidents. Thank you, Mr. I think uh, the historical importance of where we're going to be uh, ought to strike all of you because importance of history should those who are going to study history are best to repeat it. And we're sitting within miles of the very incidents that created the historic changes in American mine safety law. So whether it's Monongia in 1907 which created the Bureau of Mines, or because of the media Armington number nine disaster which led to the most recent of all, 1969 safety. Uh, our next speaker on this panel is uh, Mr. Parrish, who has recently moved from being in charge of the Fairmont area of the United Mine Workers Safety Division to becoming acting director in this Bridgeport headquarters of the entire safety division. Mr. Parrish has extensive mining experience underground in addition to having previously been with the Bureau of Mines for a total of close to the kind of years that Mr. McManus indicated namely about 28 years in mines in this parish, sir, including having worked in this county, at least in Joanne and Lowell. So it's my pleasure now to extend Mr. Parrish to be here on board. Thank you, Dr. Rolf. Good evening. First, I would like to say how pleased I am to be here as a representative of the United Mine Workers to contribute what I can to your program. As Mr. Tisdale, Mr. Mattis, and the speakers of all we will bear out. The fact that we were all that we are all interested in one thing, and that is safety in and around our coal mines. And I would ask if you please bear with us. Safety is generally a dry subject full of statistics, actions taken, and recommendations of which the seriousness of the subject alone rules out anything other than serious discussions. Unlike the United States Department of Mines, pardon me, the State Department of Mines, the Mining Enforcement Safety Administration and Company Safety Programs, the International Safety Division is relatively new. Prior to August 1973, each district in the coal fields provided the rank of call miner with advice and assistance on safety matters through a district representative. In August of 1973, the international officers working from D.C. formed our safety division. To 
better acquainted with the activities of the Safety Division. I would like to explain our structure and how we function. We have an Executive Safety Director, of which at this time I'm acting in that capacity. The Safety Director coordinates and directs all activities involving the operation of the Safety Division. He provides assistance in the field involving issues of technical nature and compiles training material to be presented at training sessions, establishes guidelines for inspectors, coordinators, and line health and safety committeemen. He is readily available to assist in problems regarding interpretations of both state and federal regulations and the National Fiduciary Coal Wage Agreement. He evaluates the results of existing guidelines regarding the efficient operation of the safety division and makes necessary adjustments. He serves on various boards and panels as directed by the international officers. By the way, these, these first few will be the, the staff people, uh, excluding anyone that we have in the field. And we have an assistant to the safety director who more or less assists in what way he can. And he acts in the temporary assignment of the safety director in the absence of the director. Serves on boards, panels, and carries out various other requests of the international officers. We have an administrative assistant to the safety director who formulates opposition to proposed law changes requested by coal operators is, is the liaison between the safety division and our legal department and also performs general office administrative duties. We have an inter international safety grievance committee who oversees all contract disputes involving safety, <coughs> which includes advising coordinators and inspectors in the dispute or grievances. Those are the staff people outside of the secretaries and the clerks. And, and to further explain the structure, will involve the coal mining industry as a whole. And due to a greater concentration of people in coal mines in one area as compared to other areas, regions were formed. And at this point in time, we have six regions. Region 1, which is this area, encompasses District 6 and 31. Region 2 is comprised wholly of District 17. Region 3 is District 29. Region 4 is Districts 11, 12, and 23. Region 5 are Districts 2, 4, and 5. Region 6 are 19, 28, and 30. The plans are being made right now to Further, uh, to further structure the division by setting up region 7, 8, and 9, which should be completed, I would say, in about a month. Each region is, is comprised of an inspector, assist, assistant inspector, and coordinators, the number of which depends again on the membership involved. And the job descriptions for the field personnel are, first of all, the Chief Inspector, who I guess along with being acting safety director is myself. I don't know how have two titles, but I have two. <laughs> the Chief Inspector is directly in charge of safety matters in Region 1. He must be available to direct and assist the other regions when assistance is needed. He is an overall charge of safety from United Mine Workers standpoint in all regions in the event of a mine fire, disaster, and so forth. He must be readily available to lend advice and direction regarding issues which are difficult to resolve and to assist the safety director or his assistants when and where necessary. Then we have the region inspectors. They are directly in charge of safety matters in their respective regions coordinate and direct the activities of the safety coordinators and are responsible for providing training sessions 
or mine health and safety committee. They also conduct inspections and investigations when necessary to assemble factual information and prepare written reports on the same. They are responsible for records, reports, and other pertinent data required to be kept in the region office. Let me get down to the workforces of the organization. They are the safety coordinators. They assist the region inspectors when required, establish safety programs in their districts, and assist them in investigations and reports on disasters, fatal accidents, and serious non fatal accidents. They should establish a system for visiting every mine in the district on a regular basis and handle grievances filed by the Mine Health and Safety Committee. They should attend as many local union meetings as possible for the purpose of discussing safety issues. And in our, in our safety committee, as with the Mining Enforcement and Safety Administration, the State Department of Mines and the Company Safety Departments. We have a goal, and the goal of the safety division is to strive on a continuing basis to achieve maximum safety in the coal mining industry with the ultimate objective of eliminating the accidents and fatality rate completely. There can be no other justification for the existence of a safety organization. There are many ways in which this objective can be attained, and the safety division will strive toward this objective through the following programs. One, the establishment of an effective training program for all members of the International Safety Division. To accomplish this, at least two <coughs> safety seminars have been conducted annually. These seminars involve two to three days of intensive training. The training classes are approved, but are not limited to the following subjects. The safety provisions in the National Bituminous Full Wage Agreement. contractual rights, legal entitlements under the 1969 Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act, updating current federal rules and regulations, previous procedures, and training safety division personnel and how to train others. And the purpose here is to pro provide training for safety division personnel in the field who will eventually become effective instructors who in turn will train, train all the local union health and safety division and the mines. Two, establish and conduct training classes for local union health and safety committee in each district. Instructors are provided for by the Mining Enforcement and Safety Administration and the International Safety Division personnel. Similar subjects are called as previously mentioned, along with respirable dust, basic ventilation, roof and rear control, and so forth. The reason for such training is to provide all the committee with copies of federal and state regulations safety manuals and other training materials to teach them federal and state regulations and enable them to recognize the hazards of a serious nature. The committee will use this training in their everyday meetings with the miners and provide them with guidance and be better equipped to make their minds a safer place to work. Three, active participation in the day-to-day -day safety problems of the committee and working is another of the programs necessary to accomplish maximum safety in the nation's coal mines. Members of the safety division are continually providing this service to the miner. This is accomplished by accompanying the miner on investigations of injuries, fatalities, and disasters. Counseling and guidance are provided on every aspect of quality safety. Four, resolving complaints and grievances involving safety is another important program handled by safety division personnel to perform various services in this regard. They handle grievances which cannot be resolved by the safety committee. They conduct third step hearings, take testimony, and at all times are available to obtain and offer legal advice and assistance. Five, the safety division works closely with COMPAC, which is the Coal Miners Political Action Committee, who works on problems of a political nature and assist them to update promulgate new safety regulations in the various coal producing states. The safety division personnel also participates in various committees, boards, and public hearings to propose new federal rules and regulations regarding all phases of both service and deep mine safety. Six, 
this is the last program and just as important as any of the preceding programs. We maintain an efficient office staff force, including secretaries, filing clerks and clerk types. They provide the backup office work necessary to make the preceding programs function smoothly. And I guess reading to be truthful about it, like in your other organizations, they're reading the backup to keep everybody going. In conclusion, let me repeat again that we are relatively new. We believe we have a good sound basis for reaching our goal. However, I personally feel that no one organization can accomplish a substantial reduction of accidents in the coal mining industry. <coughs> this has been and must continue to be a joint effort by the International Safety Commission, the Mine Enforcement and Safety Administration, the various state agencies and the coal company safety division. Through all of our efforts combined with the training for coal miners that is mandatory under federal and state regulations, and the 1974 Bituminous Coal Wage Agreement, and the introduction <coughs> into the coal industry of safer mining systems, I believe we will reach this goal in the near future. Now, I didn't bring with me any prepared material to hand out. However, if any of you would like to contact the Safety Division Office in Bridgeport, we would be pleased to help you in any way we can. If we don't have it, we certainly know what we can the information required. So feel free to call us at any time. If you want to jot the number down, it's 842-6293. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. Remember, you'll have a, a still considerable question period. I deal with doctors over at the clinic, but I'm the administrator of the clinic for both practice, and I'm not a doctor, PhD, or any other thing. Thank you, Mr. Ross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I'm kind of proud to be part of this coal mining industry. I know we've had some bad press in the past. I appreciate any opportunity to put the company's side forward. Paris said that uh, we have to have a joint effort between the NASA, UMW, and the company. Sometimes when you would sit in on some of these meetings we have, uh, kind of differ on our methods. But the, the object is the same, the reduction of injuries, to have a safe mining environment. So what I would like to do tonight is discuss the scope of the safety problem underground. What are the problems we have in uh, providing a safe atmosphere for the mine? So I brought with me tonight is a, a mine map. This is Jackson. Jackson last week showed you a mine map of Grant. I don't know if you can. Uh, superimposed over here, this uh, black outline, is the city of Charleston. So here's the, that's the city of Charleston. Here's our Keystone number one mine. So the, the underground workings, these are all entries, and tunnels, crossways. So this is the city of Charleston. This mine has 30 miles of track. Daily travel over this track 30 miles of maintain maintain travel on the route that possibly we don't want to be there, but that's the only place we have to go, we have to provide for. We have to make it safe. Whatever it's safe. Whatever that man provided, that's what we have to do. We pump in five large fans. They go from the smallest one is eight foot nine, go to eleven foot six inches nine. Um, 
million six hundred thousand cubic feet of air per minute. Water. Pinnacle Creek uh, it raises the temperature by ten degrees. Goes right across the property. By the time we pump it up and down, pump it out five and a half billion gallons of water a day. So these are some of the problems we deal with on a daily basis. So you can equate this to something like a factory. We have a section maybe up in this area, a couple down in here, a couple over in here, maybe 10 miles from this one, a couple more up in here. Each one of these is a little factory producing coal. It'll have maybe half a million dollars worth of equipment. Weigh about 80 tons mobile. So you can think of it as a a factory. And you knock out the north wall and you move that entire factory every day by 100 feet. So that's some of some of the problems we live with every day. As I said, roof control, that's one of the things the killers in the coal mine. And you have to maintain 30 miles of track, not considering the parallel one winds up several hundred miles or thousands of miles of entries in the estimate thing. And I'll discuss, Mr. McMahon has discussed some of the disasters in the coal mine related to uh, gas ignitions. I brought with me tonight some instruments we use in the mine to check for gas. You ever seen one of these all? The flame safety lamp. I guess back in the early 1700s, some of the, some of Larry's ancestors, they considered an explosion as an act of God. They didn't know what caused it. And uh, Sir Davy finally decided that it was caused by some emission from the coal. He devised this instrument ancestor of this instrument here. And the principle behind it, it has uh, wire gauze, I think, here. It's 144 mesh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them, I know that. <laughs> the principle behind it, uh, as fire goes through this fine wire mesh, it cools it. So you can have an ignition in here and it won't go to the outside atmosphere. The principle is that uh, as you have methane, you put this lamp in the methane air mixture. And the flame will ignite the methane inside the lamp and it will elongate. And we have these blue lines here and we can determine how much methane you have present in the atmosphere. <coughs> the big thing is that up in here is these gauzes, the double gauze, now required. This was the first designed in 1816, still using them today. I might say, Leonard, that Mason Well, we're still going round and around on that. I and the reasons, the reasons being is that different people see different, they have different abilities to use this as a highly trained person very reliable. And they have resulted in some kind of purpose. As I said, the gauzes prevent the flame from coming out into the atmosphere. But an improperly assembled light can cause a uh, explosion. You have the gauze at the bottom. You have this glass here to see the flame, but that was cracked. Or if the gauzes were rusted, you had a hole in it, that flame would come out and ignite into the atmosphere. And it is good. I guess about one, maybe one and a half percent. Very good man from experience man to be down about one percent, a little bit less. So the Mason requirements uh, to determine smaller than that need that another type of detector. Is it a detector? No. Uh, you have to take a test to certify for it. And it's usually right now the mess uh, mess up. Mesa, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> Mesa requires an instrument for measuring methane down to uh, 2,500. They also require a detector for measuring oxygen efficiency. So this lamp will measure oxygen efficiency, and that's what it was carried for. Uh, so down to, uh, that lamp, uh, the light will go out at 16% oxygen. And the man, of course, will live down to about 12%. Certain areas where the bad thing worked out, areas back in here that have to travel, occasionally travel, you have to determine if there is that oxygen. Present. And all the Bureau of Mines publications. This is up here you can take a look at it later. This is the principle behind it 0% as 1.3% of the plane has a long meter. 4%. It's 4.5% it goes up to the cost. So a man with real experience uh, looking at the length of that plant can tell the methane between 1 and say 5%. Okay. Uh, what is <coughs> Roughly between 5 and 50. Depending on the oxygen, too. Let's say 20% oxygen is between roughly 5 and 15. Uh, and uh, this is another methane detector. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on it. It's, it's based, this one works on, uh, has no electrical parts other than a light. It has a little light. It's based on the speed of light traveling through a meter. Uh, you have a little prism in here, it breaks the light up into a spectrum. And it has two chambers. And if you have methane in here, the speed of light speeds up, slows down. And it causes an interference on the previous spectrum. And you can, there's a little scale in here, you can read your method. This is quite accurate. This, this is one that's made in Japan. That's a rifle. Yeah, that's made in Japan. <coughs> so you use them to fight yeah. This is another one. G70. Trade name National Mining Service. This is based on electrical or Wheatstone Bridge. We have a balanced electrical circuit. When the methane is drawn across the Wheatstone Bridge, the element heats up and throws it out of balance. That difference is measured right here. It has a little built-in pump. Pulls in a pre-measured sample, kicks off, the needle will indicate how much methane is present. Seventy pump, one million six hundred thousand cubic feet of air a minute. It has to be regulated. You don't turn it loose. You have to have so much in this area, so much time here. You have more gas over there, so you direct more air over here. It's a rather complicated system using regulators. Pressure difference. One of the instruments used to measure this is an anemometer. That's straight out of the coal mine. <laughs> it has been used. We multiply that time to the cross sectional area and into the ball. These are requirements on an active section you have to have 9,000 cubic feet of air. once a well-equipped miner and the guy could hardly walk he had a car coat shoes on he had half, half a dozen of these instruments and like the little kid to dress up and go out in the cold and hardly move here's another one requirement for uh, measuring the amount of dust that a man 
three. We have here a little pump. Hope this uh, proves to be a little help here. The miner put this on the belt, pin this up here, and the sample is drawn in here over his the working environment. It's pinned right here. So this pulls in the amount of uh, pulls in the air, pulls in the sample that the man has to breathe. And at the end of the day, this is taken off in the amount of dust is away. So this little, it's called a set. These are bought from a manufacturer and they're free weight as a number of bought. So the man, after he works eight hours, will have a dust accumulation on this building. It is taken off. Sent to Mason. They weigh it and subtract the difference of them pre weighed samples. And that is the amount of uh, uh, the amount of coal dust is divided into the time the man wore. And that gives you the average concentration. <coughs> Built into this pump is a little cyclone. The air comes in, it's thrown around, and the heavier particles <coughs> fall down through here and they disperse. So this pump picks up a uh, size that is uh, almost comparable to what we go into the lungs, uh, approximately five microns. So anything larger than that is supposed to be discarded. As uh, you, if you were to breathe in a large particle like that, bigger than five microns, Trapped on the nose, what we need to run Five microns size. Small. How many Oh, there's regulations. Uh, see, a face man has to wear them every 90 days. A non face man every 120 days. Man on the surface. You know how many were taken last year in the United States? No, but I can, I can run down the sample. Got some questions. There's a good philosophy on the sample <coughs> underground. And one is uh, for compliance with the dust engines. And a man is selected on the section who works in the highest dust concentration in that area. That man is sampled, then we call him a high risk man. And if the dust standard is being achieved on that section, then this man is sampled five consecutive days every two months. And the determination of whether it's a violation or not is based on the last 10 samples. And the uh, Mason inspectors will take samples as they make their inspections. So these people are being sampled uh, quite often. That's the determination of the client. Then for uh, various other reasons, uh, for statistical reasons, for information indicated to us where we might uh, plan our inspections, uh, the people, the other people work in the ground are sample at various intervals. If he works uh, on a working section, it's 120 days. This is where the dust is being generated. If he works uh, away from the working section, which it isn't very dusty, it's 780 days. If he happens to be one of these people who have been uh, determined to have had pneumoconiosis, he has the right to transfer to a less dusty atmosphere. And when he exercises that option, we monitor his, uh, his dust levels and the company samples him once every 90 days. And so it depends on, it, it's complicated. It takes about three days of instruction <coughs> to go through all phases of this particular dust program. So there's some, some restriction way 
satisfied that this <coughs> program that carried the conclusion will do the job, then we will release that uh, machine to whether it's a long or whatever it is, go back into production solely to put forth this controlled effort and major success. And uh, one of the uh, uh, things in the act puts certain burden on the on government. It states that if uh, an operator requests assistance from MESA to achieve compliance on that section, then we must provide what assistance we have available. And this happens uh, every now and again. But uh, the dust on the long wall is one of the biggest problems left for the rest of the dust. No, it's not impossible to get it done in standards. Most of the long walls that I know of are in the mind. Now, here's a, a with, with respirable dust control. The, the respirable dust is invisible. You can't see it. So you're measuring it with a sampling instrument that tells you what it was yesterday, in effect. In fact, some representatives of the UMW and Co Company and Mesa today were discussing this very problem. It gives you yesterday's results, so you may have been in violation, you won't know about it until the results of that sample are analyzed. So at any time, if your mining condition very slightly, or if uh, the uh, ventilation system is allowed to deteriorate, or the water spray system is allowed to deteriorate, 
you may slip into violation, and and then suddenly you find out about it a few days later, and then you, you do something to bring it back in. So we do have sections that go into violation and a few days of violation is corrected. We have this happening at all the time. This happens on some long wall sections too. So at any given time, you may have uh, some of the long wall sections out of the out of compliance. You may have uh, some of the other sections out of compliance. The um, uh, most of the long walls that uh, I know of uh, are normally in compliance. Uh, we have a couple that are very difficult to work on, on some of them. No. But uh, I, I don't think it's a possible situation. Yeah. I think it's an engineering problem. All it takes is a little time and effort to count. I What did you get the total to say? Um, I believe it was in the report for about 68 or 69 dollars a year. I don't know why. If it was that old, those are English. Yeah. <laughs> and the English numbers cannot be compared to our numbers. Right, Larry? Yeah. That's one of the problems we had very early in the uh, in the uh, uh, respirable dust control is people started throwing English numbers around. Mm -hmm. And we have, as I would say, much better respirable dust control on our long walls than English. I don't think they could operate under the uh, standard that we have. Larry. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I believe now we we do more than we have. Similar things much stricter than English. Much stricter than the English. The risk of not being able to meet the standards. That I feel that we can meet these standards, and that we do meet these standards. And that uh, one walls that are running at seven and five uh, are usually shut down. You know. I, I don't know of any long wall that's operating at five or seven. I know mine doesn't. Any time mine gets to those kind of limits, it's immediately shut down. It doesn't need me some people to come in and shut it down. The management shuts it down when it gets to them kind of conditions. Uh, and it, it's technology, it's, it's an engineering problem, and uh, I'm sure that we've got enough talent in this country that we can be this. It's always a problem. It's a difficult problem to read. And it's something that you've got to keep on top of. You can't say, well, I've got it to two today and just forget about it. You've got it to two today, you've got to maintain two tomorrow. That's right. Here is a nose, like a nose, and then breathe. 
breathe, the air comes in through the bottom, and they say, oh, God, it's absorbing the carbon monoxide. legislation that's been brought into the industry and how this is supported by MESA, the State Department of Mines, by the United Mine Workers of America, which is Polish. All I can say is that right now as a manager, we, we support MESA. We support the United Mine Workers Safety We're a part of it. We don't want people to look on us now and say, well, here's MESA. State Department of Mines, United Mine Workers, 
trying to get the coal company to put in us on the other side of the fence. We are all on the same side. We're always interested in the same. We want these figures that we've seen tonight reduced to a minimum, reduced to zero if we can get it. I think we can do a better job even than what we are doing now. Now we've made a big improvement. Often the people look at the coal company and all those guys, coal companies and guys wear the black hat. When he comes on the screen, you boom. The other guys, the guys that wear the white hat, everybody cheers for him. But we're all wearing the same colored hats. We've all got the same job, and our job is to I'm a superintendent, and I've got three functions. I tell everybody. I've got safety, production, and cost. And safety is number one. I think we should do this professional. What's the, what, when you had this question, what are the differences between accidents from the plane or the wrong people and the use of the wall wall and the use of the people's monitor? I don't have the exact statistics well, for roughly. it. Roughly, I would say uh, long wall is, is much less. It is, um, basically, some of my experiences at the federal number one mine, where uh, we've worked now six long wall panels and we've been to mine on seven. And my uh, accident frequency on the long wall and short wall are much lower than they are on the continuous miners on the whole inch. And even on the masons who build stopping. My long wall is one of my short wall are on the best action in this free area. About what ratio of most mines can you reduce the use of continuous miners and turn that over the long wall? What percentage? It's coming, I feel. <coughs> and we won't do the uh, continuous mining. When I say the day's coming, it might be a long way off. <coughs> Looking way ahead. And the days I will come, I believe, when long walls and short walls will be the only method of what we call pillow. <coughs> the continuous miners we know now, driving up a panel and bringing back pillars, will, will be gone from the coal mine. I feel that we'll drive these panels on the solid of the mine. The miner will retreat and go to mine another solid panel. And we will retreat the coal with the long wall method or the short wall method. <coughs> because of the, uh, the roof support requirements. The fact that you mine, uh, continue, you've got a cycle mining systems now, where you mine 20 feet, and then you've got to come back out of the roof. The mine cannot be under any exposed roof. Uh, uh, from, a, from a production point of view, uh, it works fine on the solid section. We're having good success with this system, uh, but on the pillar section, we're finding that we feel that we've got more hazards, hazards involved. Speaking of the record, I'm speaking about a jack. We feel we've got more hazards involved in a pillar line where you go in and find 20 feet into a block of coal and come back out and go in and bolt it. And then you go running back in there and mining it again. <coughs> You're working very near a gob line. And we're experiencing a lot of lost coal. And we feel a, a, a greater hazard. So we've done this on one section so far. We're not even prepared to try it on the next section. We are planning on not bringing back a barrier block. Trying to cover what we can out of the pillars because it's on safe we do. Under present conditions, roughly, what percentage would you say could be turned over from continuous mining to long wall? Say, federal number one. Federal number one? one? I would say right now, 40% of the coal in federal number one is, is capable of being long wall. Uh, I would say the remainder could be short wall. Means that there is, there is a possibility that there is a direct ratio between the reduction of, of accidents and the use of long wall. And the long wall is the safer than and the safer than 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 the safer
I'm saying that's a early condition. Okay. Long wall's got it's got its support problems, it's got its tail entry problems, it's got its head entrance problems. Redeveloped by a miner, it's not adequately supported, or even if they are adequately supported to start with, you've been having lots of problems with these entries. And I've never told them that long wall was completely actually in Right, right. But, there, but you did say that there was a, there was a, a lower. Yes, yes. A lower rate of accident, which means there must be some established relation out there. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Perlman. Could you explain uh, what the advent of the explosion might be on the short long, long wall with the dust conditions and ventilation problems involved? You think this will increase? Say you go to all long walls and short long walls, same federal number one. Would this increase the hazards of an explosion or not? I mean, the way your mind is supposed to go to places is dead. I think you're doing an excellent job on short walls if you're long walls. Go along with it. There's a, I've never, the long wall is actually less problem. That's yeah. what you were referring to. Sulfur in the coal, possibility there. Yeah. <clears throat> I think maybe uh, yeah. gas liberation back in the I think maybe uh, some of the people might we say that they don't know what that that's what you're talking about. We just got two thousand uh just to clarify the maybe two two types of a of a dust problem. billions of dollars that 
things spent in that direction. Now, as I told you before, the budget for Mesa in next uh, next year is going to be uh, seventy nine and a half or seventy six and a half million dollars. Uh, the U.S. Bureau of Mines has many research projects that uh, uh, it's almost astronomical. I suspect we're spending about fifty million dollars a year, although I don't. We've been doing this for the last couple of three years. So it's just a matter of priorities. And uh, regardless of uh, how much they're spending now, they have not duplicated the uh, uh, array of talent and, uh, and organization uh, that NASA was. So, you know, we the people. Mac and I and uh, uh, 1,300 other people are involved in the woman health and safety. Even those figures, you know, tell you a great deal. When the 1969 Act was passed, there were some 240 in the world. There were 240, expected. And today there are 1,300. Uh, uh, old industry might, with all of its expense, <coughs> millions of dollars, uh, very serious safety directors like Mr. Moffler are in now. I have my own observation in the industry before 1968, but there wasn't a, even if their PR said there was, there wasn't a serious safety up in the uh, heart of the company. So I was, <clears throat> I like to consider myself part of the mining industry. I'm, I'm a segment that has uh, a job to do, and, and we try to do it at, at one time. I worked in the gold mine, and we had mine in southern West Virginia, in Glen Rogers. And uh, every time uh, we reduced the cost of production 25 cents a ton, the realization dropped 25 cents a ton. We reduced our cost of production 25 cents a ton again, the realization dropped 25 cents a ton. Nobody wanted to buy the coal. It seemed to be worth it. We had a certain very small segment of our national leadership that was saying we need an energy policy, we need a coal policy, but no one was listening to it. And that mine phased out as well as many others. And then the, the uh, uh, 1960, uh, just about every major coal mine in the country had a panel of men that were laid off out of work. Uh, and with that environment, uh, the, the industry was generating many profits for, uh, um, for research. I, I think, though, some of you may have a variety of views on this. Is we're in a very close political and philosophical question. There's a lot of viewpoints that are open. The, the, uh, there, there are two things you might remember historically. One is that as ugly as war is, uh, rotten side of human nature as it is, most of the great breakthroughs and discoveries have come out of the tremendous national efforts. You know, we don't know what penicillin is or an antibiotic until World War II. And, and you can do this in every field of equipment and engineering, you know, they, when we waste our efforts, uh, you know, on this kind of thing, if space is to be you know, thought of that be compared to saving the underground money. I'm sure any of us can imagine if you realize that if, if a decision was made to make the mine safe, you wouldn't have 130 men still dying from roof fall, the biggest thing in college, and these one by one kind of accidents rather than big disasters now. But there's been no such decision, I mean, and therefore it's a hazardous environment and people take a great deal of doing. The other thing, though, that Mr. Tisdale commented on is for you to think about. The fact that uh, until the Arab uh, oil crisis starting in the fall of 73, coal still had not had this tremendous cost uh, increase. It was still one of the great bargains. You know, uh, the price of coal at the land hit, you know, was still something that had hardly gone up in price with all of the labor costs because mechanization had come in to equalize. 
so that the industry was faced with these uh, years from 69 until the crisis in which their uh, production per man did go down with the advent of football. And only recently, as a price of coal, I don't mean now that recent spot coal declines and all, but the, uh, with the oil competition, whole energy business has it come back in so that their, uh, their profits are adequate and apparently they will be a, a very important uh, solution for this nation, you know, in the energy crisis. Everybody.
leave, please, without picking up your uh, handouts, which uh, tonight consists of uh, uh, this very important date, including the statistical tables <coughs> that are presented to you the inside of uh, the paper by Mr. McManus, the uh, Department of Interior uh, structure of MESA from the Secretary of Interior and <coughs> the MESA pamphlet. And then I would be less than self-serving if I didn't indicate that uh, uh, for the next two uh, Mondays now, the 17th and the 24th, uh, I, I hope you'll make every effort to uh, be present because we've uh, collected a, a, a full variety of extremely uh, <coughs> rare and illustrative slides. February 17th, 1975. You know, there's a big difference between four states and Carolina. A lot depends on what the company did 50 years ago. When you look at the people, don't blame them. Somebody did something that made them this different. One's a very peaceful community, you know, drinking pretty much under control, and settled one's a very rough place, okay? And that isn't being against anybody. It's what happens when you mistreat people. You get a response. Now, I'm going to expect you to guess at some of these, just going through these, these few five or ten minutes before we turn the lights out. This is the National Labor Union. It takes until 1869 to get the first idea of a national center. This stands for National Labor Union. The first guy that people recognize and know is William Silvis. Up till then, they never understand what a labor leader is. They're just Boston shoemakers, uh, Philadelphia, uh, shipbuilders, you know, they're just the locals. He gets the dream and the concept. He's what you call, a, even my daddy used the word, was a walk-in delegate. They elected a walk-in delegate. You know, the idea was up till then nobody could walk around between the places. That word stayed around, you see, for generations. And uh, the idea was, you were then somebody went between places, between the men, you see. National Labor Union. 18, first time to get the idea of a National Labor Center. Anybody know what... This would be K of L. Anybody know what the first big one? This this guy is very fast. It's dead with huh? Nice. Yes, Knights of Labor. These are the Knights, spelled with a K, okay? The Knights of Labor are formed, I don't know, maybe 1870s. I don't have the exact date. They reached their peak in the 80s. Okay? You're gonna see throughout, don't forget, this is a very secret order. And a lot of trouble, so this is a very secret order. And we'll talk about that in the dark. I'm going to have to make a lot of comments as we run along. And what do you think this might stand for? Yeah, Railroad Brotherhoods. They developed very strong in the 1870s, and they continue. They see that the cracks. They begin to stay. The Railroad Brotherhoods stay right on through because they're very crack-oriented at a point when many of the skilled men want to crack. They don't want to dream. They don't want a big national spokesman. They want to crack. And this... Anybody know what it stands for? American Federation of Labor. American Federation of Labor formed in 1881. This is the first national center that stayed. It lasts. It puts the craft unions all together under Samuel Gompers, and he remains its leader from them until he dies. 1924. See, it's he spans generations. And he's typical of these people. They last. You know, it still stays alive, but the point is they're typical because he's a cigar maker. And that's what they are. They're all different packs, see, put together. See this? You know what a craft union is? Anybody want to try to find in a craft union? What do you think it is? Does, it, does the word tell you enough? Is it limited to one craft? Oh, well, I don't think of the bricklayers. Aren't, aren't a great many of the craft unions limited to a craft? Carpenters, everything in the building trades is a craft, isn't it? Except as times have changed and you get a jurisdictional fight. You know, the carpenters want to control the glass doors at the airport. You get argument. Who controls it? You see, the glass workers, you know, are the carpenters, are the electricians now that they got electric guys, you see? You get jurisdictional fights out of crafts. But the crafts, essentially, some of them they try to become industrial unions. The IAM, the International Association of Machinists, is this way. They try to take in a whole aircraft plant, not just be machinists, see? All right, now what's an industrial union? If that's a craft union, name me an example of an industrial union. It takes a whole industry. 
doesn't care what the man does. They all belong to one union. We've been talking about a whole industry here. Right, the United Mine, Mine, Mine Workers, since it was formed, since it was formed in 1890, even, oh, huh, 1890, has been an industrial union. It was formed as an industrial union in an era of craft unions, you see, okay? And what's the difference at a mine? Do they ask you whether you're a carpenter? They ask you whether you're a machinist? They don't care, okay? Remember, this is a very serious difference. This is the fundamental difference. No jurisdictional plate thing here. This is going to be a bloody distinction. This is going to split apart brothers. This is going to split apart friends. This is going to split entire labor movement pieces. Not whether you're, you are willing to go with industrial unions. The mine workers did not get the idea that just the mechanics of the mine, you see, or the electricians of a something. They took any mine worker, see, anyone working at the mine. What is an international union? Why do we even use that word? The International Union of United Mine Workers of America, the International Union of Electrical Workers at Westinghouse here. I-U-E, right at Westinghouse. <coughs> the International Brotherhood of Car. What does that mean? They, they cover Russia and China and, huh? What's this mean? Why are they called international unions? What does it contrast with? What's the opposite? What's the small union? The, union? the local union, okay. The local unit is the beginning point, huh? <coughs> if you begin with a local union, then you may have a district organization or regional area organization. And then instead of, a, in our country, where do we get this idea? They don't use it in England, they don't use it anywhere else. Where do we get this? We're not especially international minded people. Where does it come from? Anybody got an idea? Does it cover Mexico? Do we go that far? Mm -hmm. It's because of Canada. It's that simple. They wanted when they first began, see, they weren't being very international. They wanted to be able to, you know, the Detroit local to go over and organize a Canadian carpenters local. That sounded very grandiose, so they got printed on their letterheads International Brotherhood of, you know, bricklayers, International Brotherhood of painters, okay? If you look at it, the whole jurisdiction is Canada and the United States. Now they're being run out of Canada on nationalist grounds, so many of them are, you know, they're coming back as, as simple. You see, the American Federation of Labor was the U.S. portion of an international's membership, didn't it? The Canadian Congress of Labor was the Canadian center, you see, of all the unions. Am I confusing you following? Hello? This is just a terminology. You'll hear it all the time. And, you know, the management of mines has to be, are you going to call the international and in Washington, what's the building? The International you know, Union Building, okay? It's the UMW. Every union uses this word, but doesn't mean any more than national, really. You with that? You don't get thrown on it. It isn't like the uh, United Nations. All right, I'm jumping you back here for definitions, but we've come all the way down here to the crash unions. We've got as far as American Federation of Labor. What's the IWW? Anybody know? The international one? You think it's international workers of the world? Anybody want to disagree? You're almost right. We've got one word off. Anybody want to try it? It's industrial workers of the world. They are going to fight the AFL in a very serious matter because the AFL is a craft union. They're going to say to the workers of the world, you need to unite by industry and you take over the factories in the whole world. Okay, very revolutionary idea. Anybody know the industrial workers of the world, the IWW's nickname? They were formed in 1905. Are they around today? They're a very small sect. You know, radical kids can write them a letter and get back a songbook and a slogan and, and so forth. They're not around bargaining for anybody. You understand what I mean? They're around as an idea. They were called wobblies. Now, they were, you ever seen a small outfit that becomes very big, very dangerous? In other words, you don't laugh at Martin Luther, do you, in 14, uh, whenever it was, 50. You see what I mean? He's going to shake the Catholic Church to its roots. You don't know what it's going to become. This movement is going to die. When then, see, see, it's going to be big from 1905, very important, until about 1920. And from then on, it's a sect, you know, just a few radical people, but the idea doesn't die. Where does it be? The idea comes back when a great leader decides to pick up that idea, okay? Who all along has laughed at the IWW 
and has put into the Constitution of his own union a clause that says nobody can belong to the United Mine Workers of America as a member of the Communist Party, Socialist Party, Fascist Party, or the IWW. But he very quickly, as he's a very changeable man, who are we talking about? All right, John L. Lewis becomes the head of the CIO because he has seized this idea. See, what's brilliant is he's decided this is the time has come. This is what the workers want. They're tired of craft unions. They're done. The building trades are organized. There's nothing left to do. And then, of course, you're going to have the two big centers that survive, right? That survives, that survives, and then they merge, right? They fight each other like the devil for about 20 years, and then they merge. And with the last 20 years, we've had a merged labor center. Have you followed this? It hasn't been too confusing. You needed just a few minutes to get this historical picture so these words mean something to you in the dark. <coughs> I only put the years up to help you. The Wobblies are going to get much more attention in the pictures here tonight than they deserve in their present membership because you've got to get the idea of why a movement like this develops everything a religious movement does. Martyrs, songs, marching, everything, see? And it comes back. An idea like that doesn't die, see? They can shoot it, they can kill it, but if it's got anything, it's going to come back. All right, just fast. We took, you understand these so far? This is just a technicality. Most of our unions are national unions, you know, headquartered in Washington or somewhere, but they may have Canadian locals. What's an independent union? It's independent of a main center. Name a union that's independent today of the FLCI. Two of the biggest in the United States are today independent unions. They do not belong to the big main labor center. UAW does not belong. That's a very big, important unit. In other words, they've got differences with George Meany. What's the other one? You have W. Okay? You don't laugh these off. There may be a dozen or two more. You don't laugh off unions that stand outside. You know who stayed outside for long years was what's called CWA, Communication Workers of America. And when a million telephone workers, you know, remain outside the main center, you don't laugh about that. When they come in, they get a price for that. In other words, George Meany gets a heart attack, he drops dead. Probably Woodstock and Miller negotiate something with the new leader. He has to move further to the left, or he has to get out of politics more, into politics more. It affects management. It affects the whole nation. You see what I mean? These changes are very big moves. They're not outside for no reason. They don't like George Meany not being active enough on enough fronts. And George Meany knows they're out there, so if you watch him on Face the Nation, you can see he sounds more like Woodstock, you see, than Woodstock does at times. He's trying to signal these guys that you can come in. You, you know what it means when they come in, don't you? Let's say the capitation is 10 cents a member, just for an example. It might be 8 cents, 6 cents, whatever the Constitution is. They bring a million members. That's a lot of income on money. See, very important to bring them in. They live off of part of the dues money. See, the dues are... Eight bucks a month, you pay to the big center so many, you know, cents a, a month per capita. Okay, just like you pay them. The local unions, you understand, pay per capita, right? To the international union. And an international union of brick masons or UMW, if it belongs to the big center, pays it some. But it pays it a little bit, see? In the international union, how are the dues divided of the mine workers? Anybody know? Present constitution, how's it divided? What are the dues? Twelve dollars. It's divided three ways, right? Present Constitution, UMW. Twelve dollars a month. How much stays in the local union? <coughs> District, like thirty-one here. International union, four dollars. See, that's very uncommon. If you were at Pittsburgh or you read the discussions, you watched them on TV, you understand this was very uncommon. This was a big political fight. More likely is what the big unions have. The international takes the lion's share. You see the dues? And it has a big legislative department and it has a big, you know, uh, bargaining department and it has a lot of international representatives servicing the locals and dealing with management. This puts two-thirds of the money out away from international unions, you see. And this, this is a very unusual situation in most international unions. Okay, we followed through. We're going to now 
You're going to see a lot about these Knights of Labor. You're going to see the early First Labor Center, the National Labor Union, the early craft unions, the first Wobblies, the first industrial union people, and you're going to see how revolutionary they are. They're working people, but they, they're going to set a tone for things later. Then the CIO, then the merge, the battle between the two survivors, AFL, I shouldn't strike them out, the others, this, they stay around, they die, they die, and the Wobblies die, effectively. The ones that survive are the Kraft Railroad Unions, the, the AFL, and it keeps changing, becoming more industrial all the time, and the CIO and the two of them then merge. And you have independent unions in addition. What's a company union? What's a company union? Are there any, you know, anybody know of a company union? It used to be like Weirton Steel had one. They just belonged to one company. They refused to belong to the steel workers union. They refused to belong to the Maverick Union. And if they are held to be a company union by the National Labor Relations Board and, the, and or the courts, then they're illegal. They can't bargain for the people. So in effect, even though they limit themselves to the company, if they become technically a company union run by the company, you know, where the foreman can influence them or the management, then they're illegal. If they limit themselves in their independence to, you know, but stay arm's length from the company and fight it and argue with it and bargain with it, some of them survive, very few. There, anyone know the difference between an open shop, a closed shop, a union shop before we start the shows? What, what's an open shop? Anybody, right? And remember the companies, you're going to see a period in the 20s when they have a slogan called the open shop which is also a guise for busting the union. They mean there has been a union shop. They intend to end it, okay? In Oklahoma, they still, they still... Yeah, yeah it, well, in, in maybe 20 states, they have yeah. laws that, that make illegal this. Now, now, do we have many closed shops? Let's take the coal industry. Is it a closed shop? I want to get... You think it is? Then what's a union shop? Okay, I said there was a choice between open, it's not an open, and I'd say, I disagree with you, I'd say it's a union shop. What's the difference? In a closed shop, the company can't hire anybody they want. A company in the Longshore Union calls the union hall on the West Coast, and they tell them, we need one man, okay? Or they say, we need one hoisting engineer, we need, you know, two dock men, is what we need. They give them a list in the morning. And the union takes from the men waiting in the hall, the senior people, or they call them on the phone, they send them out. You get what it, that's a closed shop, okay? It is closed to anybody who's not already paying dues to the union. Not many of those, really. Some of the building trades. Building trades. Building trades, right? You call it the building trades to get your men, don't you? Okay? You with me? <coughs> a union shop is a communist thing today, or a, some versions of it I don't want to confuse you with. It can get very confusing. Some of the management people and I could, you know, have a dialogue for a half hour as to variance of this, as to how complicated the union shop can get. But generally, it means that in the coal industry, the company hires whom they please, but he must join the union in some fixed period. You know, either immediately on them picking him, or in some other ways, the 30-day union shop, the uh, one-year union shop. Uh, others, suppose there's a law, like uh, one of the uh, gentlemen pointed out, like a, a forced open shop in some of the rural states, they say the union can't get a closed or a union shop, then the union evades this, and management helps them very much at, at, to evade it because it isn't practical. They're not going to let the non-union man get the wage increases for nothing. So he pays, he, he doesn't become a member. It's against his principles, so he pays the equivalent in dues, you see, uh, like his uh, taxes. You follow me? They have a whole bunch of variants of this. <laughs> then health and welfare, right? Fringe benefits, all these terminologies come in, these funds that they may require, like the tonnage in the mine workers industry, the cents per hour in the building trades in the UAW, so Okay, you get to some of the terminology, you got the history, now we're going to go with the show, okay? This will just see it.
you wouldn't, these words wouldn't throw you if we used them. A little later in the show, Mr. Alvarez persuaded me that I should use some of the family albums so you'd understand things a little better where they, I don't have where they beat me up, but I got where I was in a few other situations many, many years ago, and you'll see some, the way some of the things happen, but not the real colorful stuff. We'll start back a long time ago. That says this indenture, now this is around 1800 or around the time of the revolution. The air, there were slaves in the South, but most of the whites who came over